Well, my friends, um, 21 years today, 21 years today, uh, just a little after uh, our time right now. And do you remember where you were? Yeah, where, where were you? Pardon me? Probably here. You work? Wasn't born. Okay. I remember it so vividly because I was on my way from New Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and just arrived at Altman Hospital to visit a parishioner in the hospital. And as I walked, as I got walked in, got in the elevator and rose up to the floor and stepped out, they have those little concoves or concaves, I guess they call it, off to the side for people, the uh, family to sit and to wait and, uh, and to, you know, be comfortable. Only two patients or two family members are allowed to visit a patient at any particular time. And as I was walking by that little family area, they had a television on the wall and, and there were the pictures of the towers uh, that were billowing smoke. I remember doctors standing there and they, they, they were, were shaking their head. They, they had patients to tend to, but yet their mind wasn't there. Where were you at? It created a challenge. It created a challenge for everyone that, uh, that I saw that day. Thinking about the buildings that were destroyed and the mass death that uh, took place that day. The attempt to to save whoever they possibly could, running into areas that they knew were dangerous. The effort that kind of coalesced around the, the, I don't know if it's anger or sorrow, whatever it might be. The attempt to put a coalition together to, to make sure that this never happens again. Oh, but then there was the aftermath. There was the layoffs because, again, everything was closed down. And then shortly following that, the financial difficulties and trouble that was there because, again, nobody was doing business. The airline industry is grounded. I remember driving and looking up and not even seeing a vapor stream saying, wow, I wonder if this is what it was like when they were crossing this incredible nation of ours in wagons. The turning upside down of the stock market, which so many individuals put their trust in. I remember thinking it's going to take a long time before the pain of what we have called 9-11 to settle down. But then I, I remember thinking ever so clearly in the following weeks that that graphic and tragic demonstration of what really it was just a few people and what they accomplished. I mean, I remember reading that the FBI guessed there was 19 individuals who actually did the hijacking, and, 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 and at that time we could all agree there were 19. And yes, they paid the price for what they did. They left their homes to live here in a, in a foreign country to them. Who knows for how long. Some of them have spent a lot of time doing something they've never done before, namely learning how to fly a commercial jet. Somebody forked out a lot of money into it. I mean, flight school is not cheap. Putting people up in housing and food and caring for their families back home their daily travel here and there, and it's not cheap. It sounds like some of them left wives and children behind, and, and they were all ready to do that for what they believed in. 
and what they were willing to die for. There was a, a select group, we, we believe, of, of followers who used their political connections to build safe retreats and, and training facilities to give them an ideology and, and to finance whatever they needed and then sent them out. And you never guess what happened. It shook the world and it changed the world. And so on this the anniversary of 9-11, I started to think. I started to dream. I started to ponder. What if the church could raise up just a few men and women who were, were also dedicated to shaking up the world? But their focus was on love and not hate. What? Can it happen? What if, what if the church, there was a few individuals that, that would, would be so devoted that, that they would be cared for and, and, and prompted so that they would, would build up other people instead of destroying them? Healing instead of hurting people. You see, from those who brought that destruction on 9-11, they were patient in their time frame. They wanted to make sure that they had all the information that they needed. What if we could be patient as well? Not imposing, but impatiently our ways of thinking, but rather encouraging them along. Does a church that has grown so comfortable, sometimes indifferent to the needs of the world, many times confused about what is even here in our own city, have a chance of shaking our world up. I mean, just stop and think for a minute. And I'm talking about in, in our community alone. There, there, is, there is hunger. I don't know whether we realize it or not, but there is hunger. And if, if we don't want to believe it's here, just drive around. Come and sit in the foyer way for, for a day. Answer our phones. If we don't believe that, that people are crying out because injustice, they feel injustice and oppression is taking place in their lives, they can't get in to get the medical care that they need, just come and sit in the ER. Many parts of the world are being torn apart by ancient conflict, group battling group, but yet I would say that, that there are as many, if not more, that are gathered around the world as we will celebrate in just a few weeks on World Communion Sunday that can shake up the world and make a difference if we're only willing. So what are we going to do? I mean, my question is still there in my mind. Can a few Christians dare to dream of making a difference in today's world? I, I know of a few ladies that dared to dream and made a difference out at, at our playground recreation connection. Yeah, it can happen. I know a congregation that sacrificially gave financially to help, help across the finish line. 
I know that there are individuals who are sitting here today that, that actually sacrifice some of their time to, to move mulch and to put things together so that that could be a, a beacon of what can happen in our community. Can a few Christians dare to dream of making a difference in today's world? We have 9-11. 21 years ago, we saw a few individuals that made a difference. But let's go back several thousand years because the answer was given to us. Good can make a difference in the world. We saw it done. Jesus took 12 men, not 19. He worked with them for what we guess is probably three years. He didn't have a lot of funds and money to, to pour into them. He he didn't have any political connections. He didn't have any safe havens for them or safe houses. He had, they had very little formal education by modern standards. There were 12 that were picked out of the group, and by all means, they were not ideal candidates. Not what you would expect a group of people could in making a difference in the world, but they did. And sometimes we wonder if the church has it in them anymore. Do we have any more shaking up in us? Or have we all shooken, shaken, shooken? Are we all shooked out? There we go. But I stand here today to tell you God has not left us. The power is still there. The challenge for the 21st century church is, is simply this. It's the same challenge that Jesus gave his disciples in the first century. To make disciples of Jesus Christ. To help people come to a realization that that Christ can make a difference and can transform lives and systems and yeah that's the first goal we set our goal here at Sunbury United Methodist Church is to make and mature disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world How are we going to do that is our second goal by meeting the needs in our community with the love of Christ. How are we doing? Or is the fizz all gone? Just for the record, that was Jesus' last message to his disciples before he ascended into heaven. He told them, go and make disciples. We heard it first in our gospel lesson. Later on, he gave all authority to them in heaven and on earth. Do everything I've commanded you. Do what you've seen me do. And remember, I am always going to be with you, he said as he departed. That's our job. That's part of what uh, our United Methodist Book of Discipline reminds us of, the mission of the church, to make and mature disciples of Jesus Christ. But well, we can't do that unless we're willing to shake things up. I want you to notice in our, our gospel readings this morning that the first thing is mentioned when Jesus is saying, here's the few individuals that out of the crowds that we're following that I'm going to use to make a difference in the world, the first thing they did was go up to the mountain and to pray. He spent a night in prayer to God. And when they came, he called his disciples and chose 12 of them, named them apostles. 
let's not forget that everything that shakes up the world for Christ is always started in prayer. There's always going to be opposition and attacks. Always, always, always. Why do we get so shook up about them? What we're called is to be accountable to the mission, be accountable to what we're called to, to live up to the responsibilities God has given us. Even if there, is, there are those who will react violently. Because I'm telling you, time is short. Time to pull away from the rat race, to, to ask God, is it me? Am I one that you want to, to use? Are, are my hands the ones that you want me to wrap around someone and let them know that they are loved and cared for? Are my hands, God, the one that you, you want me to use to feed the hungry, to care for the sick? So how did Jesus train the disciples? Well, that's a huge subject in itself. But let me just highlight two key ingredients to training that the disciples went through. First, they learned by doing. You'll notice that we no longer have lectors up here leading us in worship. Uh, we no longer have a lector leading us in worship. We have lectors. Some of you are also have been asked from time to time, even from the congregation, to, to be a part of leading. We're following the example of Christ. Even the one that, that didn't succeed in catching the, the, the vision in, in John 13, Judas, who was treasure, who later betrayed Jesus, <laughs> Jesus sometimes said, take a little money out of the, out of the purse there, Judas, and, 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 and go give some money to, to those who need it the most. Several weeks down the road, we're going to hear we're going to hear about, about the time when Jesus said, hey, disciples, we've got these 5,000 people here, and guess what? They're hungry. Jesus says, well, feed them. He doesn't say, sit down, come up with a plan, form a committee, do, feed them. You see, in Matthew, the fourth chapter, People came to Jesus because they wanted to be a part. After they had watched Jesus preaching, healing, they wanted to be a part of it. That's because Jesus showed them and allowed them to do. But you see, it goes beyond that. The lesson's not complete if we only observe. That's why I spent three years working most of my time in seminary to, to learn and read and interpret and understand both ancient Greek and Hebrew to soak up everything that I could about from my professors on, on how to open up God's word and look at the original meanings of the words that are there. We were told that it would be the most valuable lesson that we could ever take into ministry, and, and were they, my professors correct, how true it is. The foundation is there, is, is not only observing, but then it's digging in, jumping in, and allowing God's word to work in your life. You see, the cost of discipleship, I, I'd like to say it this way, the cost of signing up at Jesus University is steep. We're willing to give up most everything in our lives 
to move forward. Some of us may, may have given up family time so that we could move ahead in our jobs, so that we could make the funding and the money and the, that we need, so that, that we think we need, so that we could provide without any want or need. But you see, that's not what we're called to. What we're called to is to leave everything to follow the ways of Christ. To look out for the least in our midst. To provide a way in which ministries can be started and sustained so that our mission can be completed. What did they see? They saw people who had been long alienated from God brought back home. They saw lepers that were healed not only of, of their disease, but healed inside. Their hearts had been changed and they began to experience that love of God. They saw evil that, that had had long hidden, been hidden underneath all the worries of the day come out and show its true nature so that it could be addressed. Oh yes, there was a need in the world. And Jesus was looking for a few individuals. The invitation, by the way, still stands. The need is still there. And what Jesus asks is, will you come and follow me? Will you leave everything behind? Will you come and follow me? Will you do my work, no matter where it leads you? No matter what it costs. We'll be talking in the next several weeks about a rich young ruler who said, I want to shake up the world, but I want to do it my way in the comfort of my luxurious tent with my Ferrari of a camel. So if you want to talk about these things, give me a call. I'd love to sit down with you. Because really what God needs and really what this church needs are a few individuals that's really going to say not the easy words, I'm all in, but really going to say, okay. I mean, that's what the founders of our nation did. They vowed and pledged not only all of their wealth, everything they had accumulated, they pledged to, to give up their status. They pledged to give up their very lives for this cause because they thought it would shake up the world. Shouldn't it be at least that's the same for us if we're going to change the world for Christ? So there's a need, my friends, and the need includes you. I'm, I'm going to invite Gary He's, uh, to come up and just share a couple of minutes. And, um, and Gary is uh, uh, a member on, what committee are you on, Gary? You see, want to say that a little louder? Finance committee. There you go. He's on our finance committee. Good morning. Um, I wanted to share with you, pastors, ask, and I volunteered, um, our church's financial situation. And uh, to kind of explain, the Finance Committee, if you don't know, is the, the committee that looks after the church's, the church family's financial well-being in support of, of course, our missions, and, and mainly making and maturing disciples to Christ to transform the world. 
there's a group of us. Uh, some of us are I see sitting out in the, the audience, if you will. Keith Kirkpatrick is our chair. I'm a member of Bill Finch, pastor, uh, officio member. By reason of his office, he's kind of a standing member. We have Andy Higley, who's our finance committee, or sorry, our administrative council chair. We have um, Pam Clapham, who's SPRC chair. Bob Rogers, who is uh, part of trustees. And did I forget anybody else? So Glenn and Carla Needham are lay leaders. And I think that's, that's about it. Um, the group of us meet regularly to um, look after the financial affairs of the church. We, we review financial statements. Uh, we set a budget and are responsible for fundraising, uh, all you know, in conjunction with our the church family administrative council. Um, and we meet at least quarterly Our charge is to look at the financial information, measure it to budget, and see what's, you know, see how things are going, trends, that kind of thing. And as part of that, we uh, discuss and um, try to identify trends and maintain Recently, or this year, uh, our funding, our financial situation has, um, we've been behind budget as far as um, our contributions, our giving is concerned, and for a number of reasons, uh, expenses have been a lot higher than, especially energy costs, than we had budgeted. So. Um, where we find ourselves is, as of August, the last, the latest financial information we have, we're running a deficit, and uh, and we're forecasting out because that's we we also like to do that to see where we're headed. Uh, <coughs> forecast to run a deficit monthly for the final four months of the year, and that deficit, for discussion purposes, is we think going to be about $10,000 a month. So we're in need of fundraising. This is finance committee, so that's, that's what we do. Um, <clears throat> we've already had a, as all of you probably know, we've had a, we had the Labor Day event, which was a success. It was a good first step and raised a little bit of money, but we're, we're gonna need some help um, to help us finish out the year to try to, you know, reverse trend, if you will, and uh, help us carry on, so. So let me just give some, <coughs> some uh, uh, help bring this into perspective. This is, this part of the, of, of the message is for those who are uh, regular attenders and members. If you're visiting here, uh, just kind of go to a happy place right now. <laughs> But, but uh, we've seen our, our electric bill alone uh, over the last several months, uh, which is normally about sixteen, eighteen hundred dollars a month. Uh, one month it jumped up to forty nine hundred dollars a month. Yeah, and we thought, okay, uh, you know, if that's we'll figure out, we'll cut, you know, we'll cut expenses, we'll do, we'll work on whatever. But uh, the following month it came in at sixty nine hundred dollars for the month. Now, I don't think that's going to last. I think it's going to even back down. We've had some activities in the church that, uh, that have, uh, have, have probably used a little more electricity, but as you all know, utilities are going up. And, and we're no different. We're not exempt from utility bills. I wish God would have made that part of the church plan, but that's not the way it was. So. So we've also uh, been looking at ways in which we can, uh, you know, finance committee is, is to find ways in which to fund what the church, uh, the money that the church needs to go forward. And that's why 
Gary's here talking on behalf of the Finance Committee. And they've done that. Uh, they're looking at, uh, at ways in which uh, they can generate income, fundraising, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, we've looked at it cutting expenses, and we've done that. Uh, SPRC has talked about reducing staff, and some of that has already happened, uh, you know, naturally. Uh, Vicki Rich uh, was not let go. She was hired by her own church to, to you, you know, there, uh, Vicki Troutman uh, was appointed. She was not let go. But again, God seems to be working in lightening up some of our, some of our, um, uh, some of our staffing expenses, but that still leaves a shortfall for us. So when I talk about a few individuals that get stirred for God, could God be stirring you? I know God can stir all of us and will stir, stir all of us. If it's a matter of, of, you know, just putting a little extra in, a matter of writing a check, or whatever the case might be. Um, I am in this. Catherine and I are in this with you. We've told you repeatedly, we love you. We don't want to be anywhere else. And, and again, I don't normally talk uh, about our personal finances, but Catherine and I have increased our pledge by 50%, which means we're giving 15% right now to the church because we care and because we believe in what uh, God is doing and has been doing. And so I ask you uh, to seriously um, talk to God and ask God, what, what can I do? I know it's a tough time. Inflation is up and gas is up and food is up, but I have to believe that, uh, that God can stir and God can provide. And that's what our prayer is this morning. Um, Gary, you have any last things you want to say? Maybe just to clarify that um, <clears throat> the things Pastor's talking about that we've suggested and you know changes to make, and those things will take time. Mm -hmm. And for right now, there's a, an immediate need. <clears throat> so. Um, just uh, pray for, I'd ask that you pray for all of us. That we would be able to, to stay in God's will and pray as to <clears throat> how you can help that immediate need. Which, as I said, it's great right now. So, Andy, would you be willing to come up and... Uh pray for us as a church. Andy is our chair of administrative council and, uh, and pray that God will, uh, will, will stir in our midst and will uh, provide and bless the efforts that we're involved in here. Heavenly Father, uh, you do not abandon us, but you left us with your spirit to guide us in all things. And uh, right now we, we need your guidance. We need your support and uh, moving and stirring our hearts. I thank you for all the blessings that you've uh, filled us with here at SCOMC. And we look forward to new ways, uh, new blessings in order to reach our community. So Holy Spirit, be with us this morning and as we go about our week. Amen. Amen. So my friends, there's only one way to finish this message. We don't have to stand helpless. And our call remains true. Number one, that, that Jesus would call us to shake up our community and that we would follow the leading of God in our lives so that we might be true disciples of Jesus Christ. Amen.